What is our role going to be in feeding the world? And what is the vision that we need to have of 2050? Why 2050? It's not an arbitrary year. 2050 is more than likely when the population of this planet will apex. It'll hit its highest point. This is a bit of a provocative statement, perhaps, but the truth is we are simply running out of grain. And um, the current USDA predictions are that by actually August to September of this year, the United States may be down to about a two, two week, two week supply at the rate consumption's going versus the production levels. But if we look at where this started, uh, a lot of it came from the ethanol mandate that was put in place back in 2005. And we're redefining nutrition. And we're redefining nutrition as we look at alternative raw materials. I said 300 million tons of corn. How dare we? The audacity to think that we'll take that corn and transfer 40% of it into fuel alcohol. How dare we take six pounds of it and convert it into beef? Two pounds to make one pound of poultry. That's ridiculous. Totally ridiculous. <coughs> when we have this mountain of fiber. We talked this morning a little bit about doubling the amount of animal products that we'll have to produce in the next 50 years. That's not a small change if you think about what we have to do to actually double the amount of meat, milk, and eggs that we're going to produce. It's going to be a big challenge to do that. And quite frankly, if you look at this, it's not going to be the small changes that bring this about. Agriculture in general is going to have to undergo a real revolution to be able to meet these challenges. And we've got to look at this as the quantum leaps, small changes of 1%, 2%, and efficiency do not do what we're going to need if we're going to feed this tremendous population of people that are out there. About every year since the 1960s, there's been a steady increase in the incidence and the types of infectious diseases across the world. And it's everywhere. It's both in the developed world and in the developing world. And it involves both emerging diseases, those new diseases which have not been described before, and re-emerging diseases. All in all, when you talk about those human environment and pathogen factors, we've got a fantastic situation these days for transmission of zoonotic diseases. We've got population density. We've got great reasons or abilities to contact among various species. And we've got travel and trade and migration to translocate those disease pathogens. So global food prices are up and they're likely to go higher still. We've seen some of the unrest that this has caused. And we're seeing all these increases in prices, and they will inevitably lead to an increase in prices. <coughs> Corn prices, soya prices, population. Get over it, guys. We are not going to see a reduction in corn prices. Get over it. Why? Because we produce about 300 million tons of corn. Oil prices are going to go up and up and up. And with that will come gasoline prices. And I guess what I'm saying is that we mustn't just think, well, this is something which is going to come and this is something which is going to go. We have to get used to that. And we have to get used to the social unrest which is happening over in the Middle East. Who could have thought of what would have happened, happened over the last three to four weeks? This turmoil. And yes, this world has to be fed. So what can we do? Is it a problem? Is it an opportunity? We have to see these not as challenges and negatives, but as opportunities. And those, those opportunities are going to be built on technology. It was a green revolution that got us from that 1.6 to 6.1 billion people. It was improvements in our health system. But a huge part of this was the fact that we realized that we could use nitrogen as a fertilizer source, and we dramatically increased the yields that we had in terms of our crops. So that remained the same, even though we cut these nutrients back very dramatically in these systems. And that has tremendous implications if we start thinking about what do you do in terms of mineral losses? How do you control the waste that's coming from these animals? We can do that now by changing what those animals are doing overall in their feed. 
In terms of actual meat quality then, this is where we saw our advantage with that. The total antioxidant level of that meat was up. The color index, as indicated by red here, was up, indicating that there was less deterioration of that meat during storage, and drip loss was dramatically influenced, and we maintained the integrity of that meat product much better. So we were successful in improving that meat quality. We didn't change the performance of that. Then if you look at the cost of doing this, is there a reason to do this kind of thing? In fact, we saw there was a slight cost advantage to using that program nutrition. We cut back the waste of nutrients in that system. We have maintained performance, but we had higher meat quality in that system overall. That's a pretty amazing thing. What we've done is actually programmed into that system a place where we have lower costs of diets, similar performance, and higher meat quality. For years and years and years, we've said we must feed our animals, and indeed ourselves, in organic materials, in organic minerals. And your one a day, for example. There's not a single chelated mineral in your one a day vitamin. And yet we now know that that, is, of course, is not the way that nature feeds minerals. And we have to redefine the way we feed minerals. And what happens when we do so is we can actually get 20, 30, 40, 80% less mineral used and get the same effect, one-fifth of minerals. We can use nutrients strategically. And I think this is a change in our thought process, or at least it was for me. We're developing programs that take advantage of this physiological change. And the neat thing about this is through the molecular techniques we have, we can see these changes. We've never been able to see this in the past. And now we have the opportunity to actually go in and evaluate what nutrients do and the timing of nutrient delivery to these animals overall. Molecular-based technologies are revolutionizing what we're thinking about here. That's where the revolution is going to be. We can actually program the animals. I've given you some evidence, and I'm sure we can find lots of more evidence out there that you can actually program these animals to use their nutrients differently. That's a very important thing when you think about the life cycle of some of these animals and the way we want to change nutrition in the future. We can actually use this to economically enhance performance, health, and product quality. All of those are things that have been done, and we've demonstrated those in the last couple of years. These are going to set new management standards. We're going to be looking at nutrition differently than we've ever looked at it before. The whole product of that production is called distiller's dried grains. With solubles. That is, assuming if they do the drying. Otherwise, it's distiller's grains with solubles. But it's, um, as you talk to more and more people in the poultry and swine industry in particular, that's not considered an alternative feedstuff anymore. It's not considered an alternative, an exotic feedstuff. It's just considered an ingredient now. It's commonplace. Do you ever go around the state of Kentucky and see animals standing in water? Beef animals. And this is in the middle of summer. And they're standing in water because they have mycotoxins. And mycotoxins are burning away at their feet, and their feet are warm. And so we have a major problem with mycotoxins. And once again, <coughs> science has helped us. Science, 15 PhDs, 18 masters, coming up with a solution, and we call that solution Microsorb, and it's Altec's number one product. We've got to create even more efficiency than ever with, the, with existing grains, and we've got to get more and more out of these fibrous feedstuffs. And what we're basically doing is we want to convert fiber into metabolizable energy. And how do we do that? We simply let microorganisms do that work. This is fiber. You know, the only difference between this and this, and this you can eat, and this you can't, is one simple chemical change. One's an alpha bond, one's a beta bond. One simple change. But our PhD students have shown us how to break that cellulose down, just like the termites for literally millions of years have broken cellulose down. So essentially what this is doing is releasing <coughs> the fiber from those grains and allows us to use these alternative materials. We didn't escape. Uh, epidemiologists noticed that some of our nastiest viruses come out of regions in the world of Asia and Africa in regions which are extremely selenium deficient. 
Normally, we think about, nutritionists think about the relationship between diet and the host. And medical research, pathogen effects on the host. But here in the example of selenium, status in populations, we have an example where diet affects pathogen. It's one of the reasons that we've been so interested in cellplex, in selenium yeast. If the food chain's working right, then if selenium is present in the soil and plants can take it up, they take up inorganic selenium, they form a seleno amino acid, selenomethionine. Our bodies use it, convert it, but it's passed through the food chain this way. It's taken up and it follows the uh, amino acid routes. And if it's in our animal diets, it goes into meat, milk, and eggs, and therefore <coughs> up the food chain into our diets. Dr. Arturo Casadevall, who's the head of the Infectious Disease Lab at the Albert Einstein University in New York, describes us as having gone through three eras in our use of antimicrobials in disease defense. First stage was in 1890 when serum therapies were invented. Injection of immunoglobulins against the diphtheria vaccine development happened then. Because of that unique and very close relationship, you had to have the exact, you had to have that disease and that pathogen very closely identified. Lots of progress got made over those next years in identifying diseases. In, but that pretty much came to a halt with the advent of, of antimicrobials. Because there you had something that was broader spectrum. You didn't need to have the disease that closely identified. And that is something that's kind of fallen on, our ability to diagnose there. What he says we're looking for, and I very much believe him, is this third age, one in which we can use targeted antimicrobial use and various host-enhancing immunotherapies, including nutritional kinds of things. Those are all going to require us to think about nutrition and health a bit wider. What are the big problems? Alzheimer's. Cancer. Do you know that the biggest problem, medical problem, in the country today is Alzheimer's? Do you know that it dwarfs, absolutely dwarfs, <coughs> cancer and diabetes? Because of the amount of care and attention that has to be given to an Alzheimer's patient. Well, right in this institution, we have some more wonderful wonderful thinkers. And one of those thinkers was Professor Bill Marksbury. And Bill Marksbury looked at some of the things that we were doing, and Bill Marksbury said, you know what, I think we have something really exciting in this area of Alzheimer's. And he went ahead, and on his own dollar, he checked out and evaluated some of our products. And this is what he said. In my 40 years as a scientist, I have never seen anything have this impact. In my 40 years, I have never seen anything have this impact. But when I see the one billion people hungry, and I look at the presentations we had earlier this morning, the only way we change it, and the all tech mantras that I've seen all over the world is, how can I, what can I? How can I turn this around? How can we, rev how can we have a, a, a situation, a, a, an industry that's good for the animal, good for the consumer, and good for the environment? How can I, what can I? And that's where all these explosions and research and technology is coming from, asking these questions. Because otherwise we get trapped in loops of why. And that's inaction. That's the blame, the victim. What would you do today if you thought you couldn't fail? <clears throat> what would you do? Think about what you would do. And tonight, write it down. What you would do. And tonight, write down the five things that you would like to do. And you know what they say, if you think it, ink it. And if you ink it, you're 90 to 100% more likely to do it. If you think it, ink it. What would you do? And finally, we look at beliefs. Because to feed these billion people, we need empowering beliefs. And we need soul. A belief is something to do with core certainty. And a belief is, on the red platform, I have this belief, I can't do it. On the green platform, I believe I can. And in my 13 years with Autech, I have seen the power of that. Because when all the industry was saying to Dr. Lyons, we can't, he kept saying, we can't, I believe we can, I believe we can. 